lovely audience. Thank you so much for taking the time to come out and welcome to the second um, UW Alumni Association Graduate School Race and Equity Initiative Lecture. Um, this lecture is part of a series called Race and Difference, and it is part of an entire um, initiative. You know, we have a lot to celebrate here at the university, and this has been a milestone year for us. It's the 30th anniversary of the American Ethnic Studies Department. Yeah. It's the 45th anniversary of GOMAP, the Graduate Opportunity Multicultural Achievement Program. And it's the 45th anniversary of Gender, Women, and Sexuality Studies. It used to be called Women's Studies. And these and other programs really provide a foundation for our ongoing efforts. But, you know, I really, one of my favorite uh, Martin Luther King quotes, and his birthday is tomorrow, we'll celebrate it on Monday, and we have events all week, is that, you know, the arc of the moral universe is long, but it bends towards justice. Um, the fact that these programs now are 30, 45 years old show that we've made some progress. But we have a heck of a lot more work to do. And, <laughs> and universities, there's no better place to do that work than at universities. Um, I'm not proud of the diversity at this university in that I think we should have a lot more. Um, having said that, this is probably one of the most diverse places that our students will ever be, um, partly because we're so segregated every place else. But we won't really be able to take advantage of what you learn from diversity from being in situations where you share different perspectives and look at things from different angles and deal with difference, as this talk will, if we can't talk across differences. And that's a really hard thing to do. Um, right before the series, um, we were at Wash Labatt, the intellectual house, and if you haven't been there, it's a beautiful place that really feels you know, warm and, and, and makes it, I think, a lot more possible to be vulnerable with each other. And we were doing a talk. And if I do say so myself, I did a brilliant introduction. <laughs> Um, I talked about why diversity was important in physics, and you know, and uh, and I was talking about how these conversations, talking about difference, really required us to be vulnerable, regardless of who we were. And um, I said that, you know, for students from majority backgrounds, um, it was hard because. Sometimes they're not sure about the language and they're scared of committing a microaggression and of, you know, looking stupid and, you know, how do you talk to someone else? And for the students who were not majority students, they're really vulnerable too. They might really get hurt. Someone might say a difficult thing to them and they don't know how to respond. And uh, I went on, but, and then, someone about halfway through, I had been kicking it with Ed for a while, um, a young man who was there for the talk comes up to me and says, you know, someone at my table would like you to join us so that we can talk about some of the language you used. And I said, okay. And, you know, I sat down with this group and this young woman, graduate student here, said to me, did you when you said, um, you were talking about basically power and privilege, but actually the way I said it is I said, if you're a member of the majority culture, and then I talked about that, or if you're a non-standard student. And when I heard it in her mouth, I said, I cannot believe I said that. And so I got in front of the audience and I talked about it because that's exactly the kind, it was, it was a really stupid thing to say. 
And I can't, I still can't quite believe that I said it that way, because think about the message I was giving to all the students in that room that weren't in positions of privilege. And I'm the president of the university, and I'm doing this race and an equity initiative, and I'm calling them non-standard. What does that say to them? But that's exactly what makes it so difficult to talk about difference, and I was so incredibly thankful that this young woman had the guts, because it's hard to talk to power, to tell me because I was able to use it as a teachable moment, because talking about difference does make us vulnerable and does make even someone that I would like to think is smart about these things. I study this. I started the Race and Equity Initiative. <laughs> Can say sometimes really dumb things. And we have to be willing to be vulnerable with each other. We have to be willing to talk to each other. If we can't do that in a university setting, if we can't learn how to do that together here, I have to say there's not a whole lot of chance that we're going to get it right anyplace else. And so this lecture series, um, I think, is so important. And the Race and Equity Initiative and the whole range of programs, including these difficult conversations that, we, that we're having, um, is really a very, one of the most important things I think that we're doing at this university. And I really am so pleased that we have so many people that have taken time out of what I know is a busy life to come here and to engage. And you are going to hear from someone amazing. Um, Professor Joseph is, I was telling her husband, I hope you don't mind, but I love your wife. Um, <laughs> because, you know, this is just, I mean, she is so fabulous. She takes these issues and hits them right on in her class. And um, I think that you're going to really see what a true leader she is and how sophisticated her thinking is because um, it's very easy to make this, no pun intended, black and white. Um, and the real thoughtfulness of her analysis and the playfulness of her title um, and the grace with which she talks about difficult issues. So thank you to the UW Alumni Association and to the Graduate School for producing this and so many other powerful lecture series. And we have a short video to help say, set the stage for tonight. I hope you enjoy it and then you'll be hearing from the Dean of our Graduate School. So let's have a great evening. Thank you. We believe in justice and fairness, that everyone should have equal opportunities to pursue their passions and contribute to society. What happens when we declare ourselves blind to, to color, color, to, to culture, culture, to gender, to faith, to difference? Who are we erasing when we go blind? Our world is no utopia, and blindness to difference will but not, not solve, solve our problems. problems. Ignoring them won't make them go away. Instead, we must act. Every day, we have countless opportunities to engage. Let's, Let's start, start acknowledging, acknowledging our shortcomings, shortcomings and, and talk, talk about, about them. them. Not about, about them in other people, people but in ourselves and in our workplaces, our living places, and in the places where we study and learn. Let's talk about how we can hold ourselves accountable and about how we can make changes and take action right here, right now. Let's keep the conversation going. Good evening. I'm Dave Eaton. I'm the Dean of the Graduate School. Thank you very much for joining us this evening. Uh, before we launch into the rest of this, I have the usual reminder to sh make sure your cell phones are turned off and you can't record this video because KUOW and UWTV are doing it for you. So make sure that uh, you have your uh, phones turned off and no videotaping and uh, that's wonderful news because you will be able to come back and look at this again and again on KUOW. 
Um, the foundation of this digital short that uh, you just uh, saw was inspired by President Kausay's call for a race and equity initiative last spring. Uh, I'd like to take this moment to again thank President Kausay and all of those in the administration uh, who have really been visionary leaders and who really care about social justice. So join me in thanking uh, President Kausay, please. <laughs> So at the end of the video, we asked you to please act. Please keep the conversation going. One way the graduate school is facilitating this is through our year-long eight-part series of meaningful talks that expose and explain transgressions and struggles, both systematic and personal, experienced by too many in our communities today, featuring thought leaders from our campus as well as around the world who are working to open our eyes to the consequences of prejudice and seeking solutions for social change. Please be sure to join us and please keep the conversation going. Tonight we are really excited to offer our second speaker in this series, our very own Professor Relina Joseph. Uh, professor Joseph is an associate professor in the UW's Department of Communications and an adjunct associate professor in the Department of American and Ethnic Studies as well as the uh, Department of Gender, Women, and Sexuality Studies. She's also the founding director of the UW's new Center for Communications, Difference, and Equity. She received her PhD and her Master of Arts in Ethnic Studies from University of California, San Diego, and a Bachelor of Arts in American Civilization from Brown University. Professor Joseph is interested in the mediated communication of difference, which we will learn about tonight, or how race, gender, class, and sexuality structure our understandings of the world. Her first book, titled Transcending Blackness, From the New Millennium Mulata to the Exceptional Multiracial, Multiracial, published by Duke University Press in 2013, critiques anti-black racism in mixed race African American representations in the decade leading up to President Obama's election in 2008. She's currently working on her second book, titled Screening Strategic Ambiguity, Black Women, Television Culture, and the Post-Identity Dance. This is an examination of African American women's negotiation of the ostensibly after moment of racism and sexism. She's published work in a variety of scholarly journals. She's also co-edited uh, and contributed to two collections of essays, one on women of color in higher education, and a second on African American respectable politics. In her time at the UW, Dr. Joseph has participated in a wide variety of diversity-related issues on our campus, including initiating communications departments, communicating communication and difference course arc, and co-founding Wired, not Wired Magazine. Wired is Women Investigating Race, Ethnicity, and Difference. It's a group of UW tenure-track faculty working in this area of difference. She's on the editorial boards of Communication, Culture, and Critique, and Cinema Journal, and chairs the Critical Ethnic Studies Committee of the American Studies Association. Professor Joseph is a recipient of awards and fellowships from the Ford Foundation, the Woodrow Wilson and Mellon Foundations, the University of California, the American Association of University Women, and the Walter Chapin Simpson Center for the Humanities at the University of Washington. Please join me in welcoming uh, Dr. Rolena Joseph. Um, thank you so much for that introduction. I am a first-generation college student, and as an undergraduate, I would not have imagined that I would stand up in a lecture hall this size to ask a question, much less be the one at the podium speaking. Um, so thank you all for, for coming here tonight. I want to thank uh, President Kause, Dean Taylor, Dean Eaton, Yvette Moy, and all of the members of Yvette Moy's team who have worked so hard on this event. Um, thank you to Provost Baldesty for creating my position when he was my department chair so many years ago. This talk emerged from conversations with and feedback from an, so many of my brilliant UW colleagues. Thank you to Sonnet Retman, Leilani Nishime, Habiba Ibrahim, Sasha Wellman, Ileana Rodriguez Silva, Stephanie Smallwood, Michelle Habel Payan, Christine Harold, Leah Ceccarelli, Janine Jones, Joy Williamson Lott, and Wadia Udell. Thank you to Gina Oftab, the CCDE's program manager who truly makes everything happen for us, and to all of the CCDE volunteers who are here tonight. 
Um, a special thanks to Alisa Yamaguchi, who is our Twitter intern and set up our hashtag for any of you all who are tweeting tonight. Um, the, the hashtag is difference in equity. Um, an extra special thanks to Victoria Thomas, who made the beautiful PowerPoint. Anything that looks wonderful came from her. Any mistakes that you see um, came from me. Uh, and finally, and always, thank you to my family, to James, TJ, and Naima. So let's go ahead and get started. Those of us who do social justice work are often cautioned and sometimes even admonished that we need to be mindful of not preaching to the choir. Noting such a sentiment, when Harry Belafonte gave the first talk of this Equity and Difference lecture series in October, he shared a quote of Dr. King's. If I don't preach to the choir, then the choir might stop singing. I speak to you today invoking Mr. Belafonte's and Dr. King's spirit, choirs need fortifying. So thank you to all of the members of the choir who are here, who, are here, here to, who have come here tonight. I will most definitely be speaking to you. But also let me talk to those of you who aren't necessarily in the choir, who came here tonight at the urging of a friend or the lure of extra credit points. I see you. <laughs> to all of you, please understand that not everyone should sing in the choir before they have dedicated themselves to listening, to studying, to training their voices. Some people are born tone deaf and ring flat. Those folks might actually never be left, destined to lead their voices publicly. Indeed, since they have not practiced the skill of listening, we might cringe to hear them sing. However, even if you aren't destined for the choir right now, with openness, exposure, and study, you can learn to appreciate the music. A note of guidance. Do not expect members of the choir to be your teachers. Some of us might relish the opportunity to teach you our long-developed, hard-fought skills, but others might just want you to listen, not just hear, but truly listen. And in that listening, you will learn how to provide the essential support the choir needs, and yes, perhaps eventually sing. But before we can sing or listen to the melody, let's hear the dissonance. Or rather, let's hear the difference. And no, I'm not saying the difference and dissonance are the same, but I do think that embracing difference means listening to cacophony in addition to harmony. But I'm getting ahead of myself. Tonight, I'm going to talk with you about this word difference, or as the, the title of my talk promises, what's the difference with difference? We need to carefully consider why and how and where we're using terms that tell us something about race, gender, class, sexuality, and disability, as the umbrella term difference does. But we don't just want to think about our terms in order to use the so-called right words. Those of us embroiled in diversity work are often confronted by anxious allies wanting to use the right words. Just tell me what to say. I don't want to get in trouble. African American instead of black, a plural gender neutral pronoun they instead of a singular gendered pronoun he or she, woman instead of girl, or difference instead of diversity. I bristle at this right word question as it seems to seek right words to cover wrong sentiments. And perhaps this isn't fair. Some folks really want to educate themselves to speak and act with honor and respect. But part of that education must be the recognition that minoritized people do not have the responsibility to provide the right words if interest in different people only goes as far as different words. For our language which names identities and for minoritized people for whom such language has historically been given, not chosen, our language is our power. Indeed, even the word that I just used, minoritized, spotlights power relations in the construction of the so-called minority-majority divide. I didn't use the old term minority as I'm not interested in identifying people, uh, people according to their smaller numbers. I used an in-process as opposed to a static word to show that those in the group are not smaller in significance or even perhaps in many parts of our country fewer in number, but that they have been constructed as such. Let me give you a second example. In the introduction to the 1998 edition of her canonical 1985 book, Aren't I a Woman, Female Slaves in the Plantation South, Historian Deborah Gray White explains one important change she would make between the different editions, a change in language denoting a change in power. White writes, 
Were I to write, aren't I a woman today, I would use the verb enslaved rather than the noun slave to implicate the inhumane actions of white people. The noun slave suggests a state of mind and being that is absolute and unmediated by an enslaver. And slave says more about what happened to black people without unwittingly describing the sum total of who they were. And slave forces us to remember that black men and women were Africans and African Americans before they were forced into slavery and had a new and denigrating identity assigned to them. The linguistic change from an all-encompassing noun to an acted upon verb better captures the way in which the subject position slave only means anything relationally within a system of enslavement. Deborah Gray White's change in language illuminates a change in power. Linguistic changes happen concurrently with historical and political changes, but appropriate language in the absence of other action only helps cover, for example, racism, homophobia, misogyny. So let's listen to equity as we follow difference tonight. Indeed, we cannot have difference without equity, or rather, to iterate difference without equity lays it bare to become co-opted, softened, and stripped of its ability to truly change relations of power. In my talk tonight, after providing you with some definitions, I will look at the difference equity matrix as a successor to the terms diversity, multiculturalism, or tolerance, difference and equity as part of the movement aiming to provide humanity to those of African descent, Black Lives Matter, as opposed to the indifference presented in the All Lives Matter retort. And I'll get into this more later, but I wanna underscore the idea that Black Lives Matter is a movement, All Lives Matter is a retort. Lastly, Thank you. Uh, I haven't even gotten to it yet. Uh, the, my last thing I'm gonna talk about is how a group of young women of color here at the University of Washington have created a space of difference in equity. Like the move from, to, to enslaved from slaved, minoritized from minority, black lives matter from all lives matter, the move from diversity to difference in equity present a similar relationality and an opportunity to see power and ultimately create change. So to make sure that we're all on the same page, let me define our key words here. Um, and first up is equity. While equality means that everyone gets the same resources, opportunity, access, equity means everyone gets what they need. Equity is distributive justice. A popular meme illustrates that equity amounts to fairness while equality amounts to sameness. One organization puts it this way, equity is the means, equality is the outcome. But difference is not as straightforward a word as equity. Difference, the state of being unlike, is a word without an anchor. It means dissimilar, a change, a distinguishing characteristic, a distinction. Difference makes no sense without a landmark, the special addition of a compared to. It has a fluid, decentered nature. Difference is always a word in flux in the constant state of creation, or as cultural studies scholar Stuart Hall wrote about identity and race, a word of becoming and not simply being. Difference is, in other words, the very expression of minoritized identity. Social psychologists tell us that we know nothing neutrally. What or whom we observe is either interpreted as like us, which often produces in-group favoritism or bias, or dissimilar from us, which produ produces out-group negativity. UW Bothell psychology professor and community psychologist Wadia Udell explains, we view the world and people in reference to our own identities, placing positive values to those whom we perceive as similar and negative values to those who are dissimilar. As difference is gauged as neither neutral nor objective, it's represented as oppositional. Thus, black gains its meaning because it is not its ostensible opposite, white. Female signifies because it is not its ostensible opposite male. Interstitial figures, those mixed race and transgender who cannot or will not pass, and especially those who are ambiguously race or gendered, cause problems because they destroy our convenient binaries. UW history professor Ileana Rodriguez Silva points out that such binaries are not inherent. They come from Christian Western thought and the practices of colonialism. We live in a society that is profoundly unequal and inequitable. 
UW sociology professor Hedwig Lee points out that race structures every moment in our lives from our birth, our birth weights, if we are to be preterm versus full term at the time of our birth, indeed if our infants will survive, to our death, from our life expectancy rates, to the number of deaths in our population. If we embrace difference without striving for equity, we create such inequality through forces like All Lives Matter. Without equity, race can appear to be volitional. It happens through choice. It seems to be whitewashed. It springs up through a sanitized version of history where racial progress is on the continual upswing. It's individual. Racialized identity does not happen in community and it's interchangeable, as race is not about racially specific experiences. But if we read race as difference with equity, as constituted in Black Lives Matter, we see it as ascribed, not volitional, as community, not individual, as historical and structural, not whitewashed, and even as embodied, not interchangeable. Difference when conjoined with equity is about access, power, and change. So now that we have those definitions under our belt, let's think about the presence of this word difference in our institution here in academia. Difference is a term that late 20th and early 21st century scholars, critics, and practitioners of race, gender, disability, and sexuality have claimed. When professors Janine Jones from the College of Education, Habiba Ibrahim from the English Department, and I got together in 2007 to form our faculty group for female professors who centered race, gender, class, and sexuality in our home and work lives, Dr. Ibrahim christened us Wired. When members of the communication department community chose the name for our new center, we invoked this term for our CCDE, the Center for Communication Difference and Equity. And when the graduate school named this series to connect with President Kausay's Race and Equity Initiative, they called it Equity and Difference. If you start to pay attention to the words, you'll notice that difference is all around us. And yet, unlike diversity, which is constantly defined and redefined in institutional context, as just about every diversity statement begins with a definition of that term, I have found that difference is assumed by scholars and critics alike to be self-evident, to speak for itself. It means more than just race, and not just diversity. But difference is left largely untheorized. We use it almost reflexively. We presume that we know what it means both to ourselves and to, an, to others. And as a race scholar, this unsettles me. So to situate difference, I'm gonna look at its predecessors, tolerance, diversity, and multiculturalism. Difference replaces or rather revises other terms that, that have come to mean a deviation from a perceived norm. Where does difference lie in relation to multiculturalism, tolerance, and diversity? So first up, tolerance. Tolerance is the initial step to putting up with difference. <laughs> tolerance is not engagement, approval, acceptance, openness, or embrace. When I ask students what they tolerate, and these are their actual examples, they tell me that they tolerate a roommate's clipping her toenails on the common room coffee table because they don't want to get into a fight. They tell me they tolerate filling and cheap but unhealthy packets of ramen noodles because their financial aid check has been tapped out buying textbooks. They tell me they tolerate the prying fingers of new dorm mates on their hair because they don't want to call out people they live day in and day out with on their racism. In other words, we always tolerate something unpleasant. We must bite our tongues and bide our time in order to remain silent about poor grooming habits, dietary compromises, and racial microaggressions. More, in tolerating the unpleasant entity, there is no impetus for whom or what we are tolerating to change, as those of us observing the distasteful behavior don't express our objections. Tolerance depends upon silence, even if the silence is silent dissent. And yet, the word tolerance has historically been upheld as progress in a social justice context. Some of our contemporary mythology about the civil rights movement was that the goal of activists was tolerance of African Americans by whites. Indeed, the phrase civil rights movement itself can be seen as one of tolerance. 
Historians such as UW, edu uh, UW education professor Joy Williamson Lott use the phrase black freedom struggle in lieu of the oft misunderstood and misused phrase civil rights movement as in Williamson Lott's words, the movement was bigger than a demand for constitutional legal rights. It was about human dignity. In the black freedom struggles fight for human dig dignity, it's important to note that Dr. King never used the word tolerance. King's goals were far more expansive and intrusive. He demanded a share of this country, the equity that was kept from and continues to elude African Americans. Put another way by critical race scholar Kimberly Williams Crenshaw, it's not about supplication, it's about power. It's not about asking, it's about demanding. It's not about convincing those who are currently in power, it's about changing the very face of power itself. In other words, changing racial structures of power is never about tolerance. Another predecessor to difference is multiculturalism. Multiculturalism was first used in 1950s Canada to provide a space for both French, Canadian, and British Canadian cultures. In the United States, multiculturalism initially grew out of, not out of government policy, but as a bottom-up push from the black freedom struggle and subsequent pride movements. But in the university, multiculturalism has taken the strongest hold in the field of education. Christine Sleater and Peter, Mc, Peter McLaren trace multicultural, multicultural education to the concerns of mainly white educator activists for African American st uh, students in the civil rights movement. Sleater and McLaren describe how the term multicultural education was used rather than racism, quote, so that audiences of white educators would listen. While this tempered approach, one of not naming the truly discordant issue at hand, might have appeared to be a positive initial step, the authors write that because of the erasure of the word racism, many white educators have pulled multicultural education away from social struggles and redefined it to mean the celebration of ethnic foods and festivals. This is not to say that the word is not claimed by scholars who use multiculturalism in a resistant fashion. Education scholars at the UW uphold the area's social justice roots. Education professor Janine Jones defines multiculturalism, quote, as an inclusive construct that recognizes that with each person, coexisting cultures can interrelate and influence each other. Jones's definition, which builds on the work of her UW College of Education colleagues James Banks and Geneva Gay, draws upon students' minoritized cultures as a form of, in Jones's words, strength and renewal a truly anti-racist move when ex executed in her research. For example, Jones's latest equity-focused research project uses Sisters of Nia, a cultural enrichment curriculum rooted in Afrocentric principles in order to cultivate ethnic identity and resilience for African-American middle school girls who are fostered in white households. Foster youth have a 48% graduation rate compared to the 72% of non-foster youth in Washington State. And Jones's use of multiculturalism fights to eliminate such disparities. So while tolerance is bandied about in popular discourse and multiculturalism has its home in education departments, diversity is a term that is most used by educations of higher institution, including our own. At the university, does diversity work amount to, as education scholar Sonia Nieto writes, quote, tinkering with the edges of the system to yield few positive results, or does it disrupt, quote, the very center of power? To answer one, both questions, one must follow diversity to its very definition, and I will go again to our UW con uh, context. So for a number of years, if you went to uh, the diversity portal, of the University of Washington, you would see the word diversity featured in large, bold, purple font. Directly next to this word in smaller but equally emphatic wording comes the heart of the university's diversity mission statement. At the University of Washington, diversity is integral to excellence. We value and, and honor diverse experiences and perspectives, strive to create welcoming and respectful learning environments, and promote access, opportunity, and justice for all. In this proclamation, diversity is not additive or ancillary in the, to the academic mission of the university, it's central. The active verbs value, honor, strive, and promote make the claim that the university is a dynamic, conscientious, and hardworking participant in the creation, fostering, and maintenance of diversity. 
Such strong statements about diversity and minoritized individuals speak back to our anti-affirmative action, anti -affirmative action moment and claim a space for underrepresented minorities at the university despite attempts at legislative hand tying. Now, I understand diversity statements are aspirational. These are beautiful arias unsullied by discordant equity issues. But how in this resonant song do we insert equity? Where do we account for the fact that our lofty goals fall in the face of our racialized realities? While the numbers of underrepresented minority undergraduates remain small, and these are a couple of years old but not that different from today, these numbers look sizable compared to the numbers of, under, of graduate and professional students, and even more significant when looking at the demographics of the tenure and tenure track faculty. Because of the gap between aspiration and reality, some scholars are skeptical about diversity initiatives creating equity. Some, like post-colonial feminist theorist Chandra Mohanty, write of diversity as a discourse which, quote, bypasses power as well as history to suggest a harmonious, empty pluralism, unquote, an emptiness I suggest that is akin to tolerance. An instantiation of Mohanty's critique can be seen in the growing ubiquity of diversity wheels, a way to visualize the multiple aspects of our identities. In the wrong hands, taught as difference without equity, identity can be imagined as a Wheel of Fortune style spinner where what one performs simply depends on the spin. Is it time for race? Is it time for gender? <laughs> this one from the Coast Guard puts personality at the very center. There is no consideration of oppression or privilege or history or structure as all things are weighted equally. The term difference comes next in our genealogy, but I don't want to present it as a panacea. The use of a new term in and of itself doesn't create a new song for us. In fact, because difference arrives at a moment where post-racial ideologies are predominant, where, for example, last month the black female CEO of Sam's Club was taken to task for being racist to white males because she talked about the importance of simply not having a white male leadership. In this example of racial indifference, history and power are ignored to focus solely on individuals, and individual white men pitted against this black woman. Without equity, this is indeed what difference could become. When I teach difference, I present it like diversity as an aspirational word, but unlike diversity, I present it as something inseparable from equity. Difference and equity create change and do not simply avoid offense. In fact, suturing difference to equity means that you might just offend. In my definition, difference embraces the qualities of connection and pride from multiculturalism, along with the realities of intersectional identities, power, and privilege. Difference with equity means these things to me because I understand it relationally. It stands on the shoulders of tolerance, multiculturalism, and diversity, and recants and revises elements of those terms. How do difference and equity operate with the buzz phrase of indifference, all lives matter? So in this second example, I'm going to talk about how Black Lives Matter is about centering difference and equity, and All Lives Matter is about erasing both difference and equity um, and creating a indifference in black lives. For those of you who don't know, Black Lives Matter was founded by three black women activists who, in the words of one of them, created a call to action for black people after 17-year-old Trayvon Martin was posthumously placed on trial for his own murder and the killer George Zimmerman was not held accountable for the crime he committed. Black Lives Matter highlights the racialized violence made manifest through disproportionality and disparity. Black Lives Matter con confronts the indifference that produces antipathy. Black Lives Matter, one of the leaders explains, is a unique contribution that goes beyond the extrajudicial killings of black people by police and vigilantes. Black Lives Matter affirms the lives of black queer and trans folks, disabled folks, black undocumented folks, folks with records, women, and all black lives along the gender spectrum. It centers those who, that have been marginalized within black liberation movements. It is a tactic to rebuild the black liberation movement. So I teased you with this earlier, 
All Lives Matter emerged as a retort to Black Lives Matter, an attempted cover-up to the very real violence against black lives recorded by cell phones, disseminated through social media, and made real to the mainstream through popular media. So I want to underscore this idea that the rallying cry, All Lives Matter, is a retort, an angry response. It's not a movement analogous to Black Lives Matter, but a silencing strategy that aims to end discussion about racialized violence. All Lives Matter gets stuck on language, having the audacity to name and claim black, which I do understand feels exclusionary to some under the aegis of a movement. It might feel like perhaps the choir won't let you take the stage with them, let me speak to those of you struggling with this idea and also possibly aspiring to the choir by looking at some metaphors. Journalist Leonard Pitts invokes the metaphor of broken bones. If you've broken your left wrist, he questioned, how would you respond if the doctor wants to examine every bone in your body as all bones matter? <laughs> Writer Jamila King's metaphor is of food. What if your family sits down to dinner and your plate is skipped? Your request to get my fair share is met by your father's response, everyone should get their fair share, and yet the platters never get passed to you. A contributor to the Daily Cost uses the metaphor of a neighbor's house catching fire. When the neighbor runs out to ask for help, another neighbor responds, why should her house get more attention than mine? I need a new roof. Another response, look at that rude woman yelling and screaming, I'm entertaining guests. While a third says, I'm sorry, but all our houses are important. Legal scholar John A. Powell uses the metaphor of a rising tide. He says, it turns out that some folks may not have a boat and the rising tide does not raise them up, but instead drowns them. Consider the universal goal of getting everyone out of New Orleans as the levees broke after Hurricane Katrina. The strategy was get in your vehicle and drive to safety. But as it turned out, many people, a disproportionate many of whom were African American, did not have cars. The universal strategy, safety for all, turned out not to be attainable for many. These metaphors illuminate that Black Lives Matter is not about harming non-black people, but instead attending to the very real and imminent violence faced by people of African descent in this country. It's about equity. However, through indifference, through bastardizing the logic of multiculturalism and diversity, All Lives Matter fosters such violence. All Lives Matter might pretend to be about equality, but it's actually about bolstering white privilege and tapping into old school white supremacy. A deep understanding of such disparities empowers student activists to take up the mantle of Black Lives Matter to protest not only the murders of black men and women nationwide, but also the racialized violence and injustice locally, including on their own campuses. They fight threats of violence and racial slurs while walking across campus, as at Mizzou, over social media, as at Western, or, pro protesting, uh, or protesting black underrepresentation, as at the UW during our walkout last February. At Yale, they protest racist parodies in the form of Halloween costumes. At Georgetown and Princeton, buildings named after segregationists and enslavers. Across the country, they protest the gross underrepresentation of black students in their lecture halls and black professors in front of their classrooms. While many self-described self liberal supporters are shocked and outraged at the facts of black death at the hands of police officers, support wanes when it comes to supporting protests about other registers of difference and equity, particularly those that fall in the realm of representation, such as the wearing of Halloween costumes or the naming of buildings. Those demands are posited as petty and unworthy, as all lives matter if in content, if not in name, becomes the rallying cry. But representational demands are demands of not just difference, but equity. Consider this one example of how black murder is connected to inhuman representations of black people. When Officer Darren Wilson described Michael Brown in his grand jury testimony, he used the word demon. Wilson imaged Brown 
as so devoid of humanity that he narrates Brown's behavior after shooting him as, quote, almost bulking up to run through the shots, like it was making him mad that I'm shooting at him. And that face that he had was looking straight through me, like I wasn't even there. I wasn't even anything in his way. Wilson's mental image, his representation of Brown, is that he is a monster, a supervillain, not a man. Such a skewed representation in Wilson's mind helps justify his committing murder and, of course, helps justify him never having to face any charges for this murder. Representations can be the very force of violence. Lionizing segregationists with enslavers on their build, on their, with their names on buildings is a form of representational violence. Classrooms that tolerate black students but never invite them into the fold, never mentor them, as mentoring is still imagined by many as the means to bolster the future career of a little me, and never populate the pipelines for law school, medical school, PhD programs with them is to me a form of violence. If we are to, to create truly anti-racist spaces, we must embrace difference in equity in not just the realm of racialized violence that comes from guns and batons, but also the racialized violence that comes from ignoring racist slurs, costumes, and naming practices. Student activists and others show us how to connect these micro and macro forces of racism under the mantle of Black Lives Matter. Our student activists not only center difference, but unapologetically suture it to equity. Students are connecting the matrix of oppression, to use the words of sociologist Patricia Hill Collins, to illuminate all of the ways in which racism infiltrates our everyday lives. Racialized violence happens through police brutalities and through brutal racial slurs. So if all lives matter amounts to indifference, and difference and equity signify a move towards change, difference and equity signify a move towards change. Difference and equity might mean protesting through walkouts or hunger strikes or, and here's a plug for us here, um, participating in our teach-in at the ECC next Friday. Difference in equity might also mean consciously creating spaces of critique with a group of friends, which is the final portion of my talk tonight. This example comes from the last book of my new book, in, uh, not last chapter, rather, of my new book in progress, Screening Strategic Ambiguity, Reading Black Female Resistance to the Post-Racial Lie. So in the spring of 2009, I conducted a small audience study with nine young women of color in their late teens and early 20s who were training to be teachers, writers, dancers, scientists, and activists. We watched a season of their favorite television show at the time, the modeling competition reality program, America's Next Top Model. Our sessions illustrated the very real ways, real life ways of the groups, that groups can come together to foster conscious critique, to stake a claim for themselves in a racist and sexist world, and to provide themselves with the tools to live both difference and equity. At our gatherings, the women spoke, often spoke in an easy, relaxed, uh, and familiar manner, characteristic of what sociolinguist and UW professor of French and Italian studies, Maya Angela Smith, describes as, quote, a racialized narrative in which they cut each other off, spoke over each other, and repeated each other. So let me set the scene for the time period of our viewing session, the spring of 2009, and let me also hear, let you hear some of the women's voices. This group of young women were abuzz about, about pop star Rihanna's brutal beating by her boyfriend and then musician Chris Brown, and the media's will she or won't she go back to him debate. They exclaimed, as Vanessa did, that there is nothing that she could have done except killed his mama to deserve to get her ass beat like that, as well as puzzled like Valentina, but I'm saying, what are you doing going back to him? Like the rest of the country, they scrutinized the media coverage of football player Michael Vick's dog fighting and called out the racialized double standard of the outrage of the killing of dogs but not the murder of African Americans. McCall noted, the media completely turned on Vick and, and Mickey agreed, adding, I know dog fighting's bad, like totally, I get it, but they treated him like he had serial murdered somebody. They commiserated about their hunger for and paucity of images of women of color in the media and shared their experience of having the excitement about Beyonce's gracing the cover of Vogue turn to frustration when, as Camille put it, and so I'm like, okay, I'm literally buying this magazine just because Beyonce's on the cover. But when I flipped through the magazine, there were no other people of color and they were just like stick figures, white blonde women. All of the women were constantly on the hunt for images of women of color, and all of the women maintained a powerful critique of racialized patriarchy. Both of these desires found home, their home in our discussions of America's Next Top Model. 
While the show itself drew them in week after week, the show's host, supermodel Tyra Banks, roused their unmitigated disgust. They hate watched her. <laughs> they found Banks to be fake, a sellout, a misogynist, racially biased, and unapologetically and disproportionately cruel to women of color. For the women in my study, productive and pleasurable hate watching, watching fashion not only scripts for di difference in equity, but counter scripts to indifference. The same students who carefully couched their words in, cl in class when a classmate said something that struck them as racist or sexist, i.e. they tolerated them, spoke up in bold and body hate watching critique during our screening sessions together. So let me give you an example. In assessing the, the excessively sexualized representations of black female characters on television, the women were concerned about the power of stereotyping influencing other viewers' ideas about black women. They lamented how a white woman exhibiting hypersexual behavior on a show is not going to bear the responsibility for all white women being stereotyped as hypersexual, but black women are. Vanessa explained, well, it's like when teenage white girls, they don't talk about the little white girl. They're gonna talk about the little black girl. Like it makes black, black people look terrible. They're comparing us to her. Mickey concurred that their white classmates must think, we probably do splits and do booty pops, this is the term that predated twerk. Um, <laughs> Mickey's comments animated Vanessa to the conversation moved from a hypothetical description to a role play for a very real situation. Vanessa positioned herself as Mickey, responding to an imaginary white classmate choosing a first person address. She says, I'm like, no, but I'm still black. Booty? Like, what's booty pop? Can you define booty pop? <laughs> to interrupt racism, a person can feign ignorance to the controlling image and ask for elaboration. A strategy like the one Vanessa offers up forces an individual who has made a racist remark have to awkwardly define and explain use of the stereotype that might have mindlessly slipped out. In the resistance space of their viewing session, the women validated their own experiences of racism by cataloging all the stereotypes they had been asked and refuting the stereotypes by imagining themselves saying, what are you talking about? Yeah, I can't help you there, pal, and no. <laughs> They repeated, I don't and I can't, which equal refusal to participate in pretending that racism, even coded post-racial racism, didn't exist. So from this lively interaction, the women moved to a quieter, slower reflection. Jen said, it's funny, cause like we're kidding, but like I've had almost all of these questions asked to me, and all the dashes denote this overlapping conversation. Mickey says, someone asked if you could booty pop? Jen says, they asked me that, and I didn't know what it was. They used a different word, but they were explaining what women do in some of the videos when they like lean on the car. And I was like, I don't even know what you're asking me. And it was like, no, I can't. And then the next question was, well, do black guys like that? And it was, after I just told you, I don't know how to do it, so I wouldn't know. <laughs> Mickey says, well, like, I'm not a black guy. <laughs> Vanessa says, you're the expert in black women and black dudes. Jen says, and then, you know, another girl came up to me one time and she put her arm around me and she goes, I'm really glad you're not one of those ghetto black girls. Like it was a, uh, Mickey interrupts, I've gotten that, Jen says, like it was a compliment. And it's kind of, you don't know, Vanessa says, what to say. Jen says, what to say right away. Like you don't know how to kind of, Mickey responds, her voice thick with sarcasm, thanks for complimenting me while insulting me, my race, and my people? Thank you. <laughs> Jen said, it's kind of, yeah, people really ask those questions. And it's not a leap to think that people like watch this stuff and start thinking those things. Minoritized people spend so much time questioning ourselves as to if a, if a comment was actually offensive or if we're being hypersensitive. If we're allowed to respond or if we must remain silent. In short, if we have permission to identify racism as such. The viewing session enabled the women to say yes to all three modes of internal questioning. Hate watching and the impromptu workshop to counter everyday racism that arose bonded their women of color community in articulating the type of critique at the very heart of difference and equity. Their community functioned as the antidote to the clenched teeth survival strategy of tolerance, which flourishes alone and never in community. Because of the type of scholarship that I do, I don't claim these women to constitute a representative sample, but I also do not think that their opinions and interactions with each other are anomalous. 
They exemplify a slice of life that shows an unencumbered resistance to controlling images of black women in media, the type of responses that happen across living rooms, dorm couches, group texts, Facebook feeds, and Twitter streams across the world. These women's critiques, their connections, their very understanding of black womanhood was accessed just as much through their co-constitutive process of hate-watching television as it was with their engagement with each other. As they critiqued code switching, respectability politics, colorism, tokenism, stereotyping, and the management of difference, they made sense of their own racialized and gendered lives and turned hate watching into a space of pleasure and productivity and ultimately a space of difference and equity. So I began this talk quoting Dr. King and using the metaphor of the choir, and I want to end it quoting black feminist scholar and poet Audre Lorde and using another musical metaphor, one of polyrhythms. Lorde writes, it's not our differences that divide us, it's our inability to recognize, accept, and celebrate those differences. In Lorde's conception, difference provides all of us, activists and scholars, members of the choir and novice listeners, with a way to build coalition. Polyrhythmic coalitions might not actually sound as coherent as a choir, but might, as UW Gender Women's Sexuality Studies professor Michelle Habel Payan describes, be a multifaceted, pluralistic, musical conversation full of overlapping percussive moments. If some of you are now feeling ready to join the choir, maybe the beautifully discordant choir, try this. Practice, study, get some other aspiring choir members together to give each other feedback on your singing, and then begin to compose tunes together. Before you step up to the choir, begin by humming. Work up to singing. <laughs> I invite those of you who aren't already singing to imagine a transformative experience it would be to hear new voices, not just our usual soloists. Let's sing, let's listen, and let's consciously create our spaces of difference and equity together. Thank you. I'm good there, didn't you? See? I'm Ed Taylor, um, Dean of Undergraduate Academic Affairs. Um, President Kalsay, you, you, um, you started with d describing a mistake that you made in front of a couple hundred students. Um, and then you stepped back up to the microphone and you talked about the mistake that you, that you made. Um, and, and I was there. What was interesting about what happened was um, you started a conversation and you stayed in the room to actually hear what happened in the conversation, which was really unique and different as presidents go, who usually sneak out the back door and they start a conversation. So I just want to thank you for actually staying in the conversation. Which, Raylena, when I asked you about this talk, Dr. Joseph, can I call you Raylena at the please, moment? Please, and, and so please, Dr. here's what we're going to do. I'm going to start with the question, and then there are microphones at, at either end of the, of the hall, and I'll ask you certainly to come and, and ask a question. And of course, in my role, I, I need to ask a couple of things that the question be concise, and that there actually be a question, <laughs> might, might I bet. <laughs> so um, I used to sing in choirs when I was in middle school. And, and had a teacher who would tap on the podium and she would get us to lift our head and, and look up. And we usually sang pretty, pretty positive songs. You're a good man, Charlie Brown. We actually sang that. <laughs> um, when I, I think about the, the, the songs that we're singing now, when you reference Trayvon Martin and, and Eric Garner and others, it seems to me that, that the songs that we're singing are starting on a blue note. Mm. Can, can you talk about the conditions necessary for singing not songs about Charlie Brown, but necessarily singing songs that, that, that start with the blues. What are the conditions necessary to, to sing in the choir that you're trying to conduct? With? I think that the, the conditions are right here and right now that we're singing out of necessity. And I think that, that part of my turning to that, that choir metaphor was to try and think about all of the ways in which we could have voices coming together at different points and how Sometimes being silent and supportive, understanding the role of the ally, is sometimes to actually learn how to be silent and speak up when people need him or her to is an important moment as well. You're supposed to be emailing questions too if you, if you have them. Is there, a, is there a place to send questions? That's why I'm holding the pad here. Is it there? Okay, so feel free to email questions and feel free to come to the mic. 
And I'll put up as we're doing this also um, information about the, the teach and registration if people wanted to write that down. We have a question here, but one second. So when I, when I, I read your talk, and I asked you what something, what important message did you want to deliver? And you delivered so many important messages. But the first thing you said was the importance of listening and hearing. Is there a distinction between listening and hearing that you want to make? And why did you start with listening as being so critical to your talk? Yeah, absolutely. I think that uh, sometimes listening is about um, getting ready for that response, that retort right away. Right? It's like, OK, 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 I'm, I'm, I need to get to the point where I need to make my statement. Um, as opposed to hearing actually depends upon you being silent, right? You taking everything in uh, and not formulating that response right away. You perhaps sitting with the discomfort and then sp stepping back into it in the next moment. We have a question here. Ooh, that's kind of heavy for, I'm, I'm not sure if folks can hear me or not. Um, it's kind of heavy as a woman of, of color to hear that I have to learn how to be silent when I feel like all of my life I've been taught or co coerced into being silent. And so I want to I wanna know how, instead of learning how to productively be silent, how to actually productively work with my allies and have them know that my voice is important, even if I can't stand in front of a podium and I have to be in the audience instead. How is it that I can actually have a voice while sitting in the audience and having a white counterpart speak towards racial equity and social justice yeah. and be the expert on it? I'm supposed to, one of us Thank is supposed you. to repeat the question. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That was pretty clear. Th Thank Isn't you for clear? having the courage. Let me see if I can do justice to the question you said as a woman of color. Ha that, that's okay, there was a lot in it, but there was a question, thank you for that. Thank you for the courage to stand up and ask yeah. it. As a woman of color, how do I start from a position of listening when I've actually got something to, to say, and you also invoke the role of, of white allies in, in this, and the relationship between you as a woman of color and, and white allies, and the role, and you're asked to listen so much and to hear so much, and, and to invoke the relationship between mm -hmm. the two of those. Really, that completely? Yeah, yeah, thank you. Um, I, I'm supposed to, I wanna walk over there and I'm supposed to stand by this mic, so apologies for that. Um, my metaphor of silence was actually not for you, friend. Um, it was for the white allies. So, uh, apologies if that got lost in the metaphor, but to be crystal clear, we are all tired of being spoken for. We are tired of people speaking for us all of the time. We need to clean that space and tell other people they need to hear us. And how to do that with allies, with, with white allies, I think to come together first with other groups of women of color. Um, for me, that has been my salvation. When I talked a little bit about our group here at the University of Washington, our wired group of women of color faculty, um, that has personally gotten me through uh, so many different fights, so many different, different times when I needed, needed the support of the structure, and also um, the bodies to help, help really launch the fight. I think that coming together with groups of coalitions so with a coalition of women of color to talk to the white allies, to try and um, have the people who are singing learn how to be silent, uh, that's one of the most difficult things in the world. And yet, we know that if we're going to create change, we have to do that together. For me, working towards a specific cause, working for uh, um, a particular um, means to an end, is the most important thing, as opposed to coming together simply to process. Um, that, that's, that's, at this point, other times I'm feeling more open to process, but at this particular moment, I'm thinking about working towards a specific end. The, thank you, Relina. It's Ask Relina, Ask Relina J. No, that's, you better say no. Ask RLJ. Ask RLJ yeah. at uw.edu. Other questions? I have another question for you after this, but I'll let her speak. Hi. Um, Hi there. First, thank you so much for speaking. Thank um, you. There was a lot of really inspirational stuff that you said. There was one moment that I would like to call you out on. Yeah. Um, you were actually speaking about violence 
and you used the term bastardization. And I, I felt it and I wanted to say something, but that was, that was the one moment. So yeah, I'd just thank like you. to say that, that you know, for, for many of us, especially in the context of a history of characterizations of racial identities and family structures, that was maybe not what I would have liked to have heard. But anyway, that was. That yeah, was thank you. Yeah, of course. I will, ch I will change that. Yeah, thanks. Thank you. That 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 it takes that takes a tremendous amount of courage. Yeah, thank you. Sir. Yeah, thank you. I, I have another question, but I see a president at the at the microphone. So thank you. <laughs> no, I'm asking this question as an individual, um, which I get to play every once in a while. Yeah. It's it's past that time when I'm president. No, it, it's something that I'm really struggling with as we are having a new Supreme Court looking at, uh, you know, the whole issue of. Um, can we take race into admissions? Mm -hmm. And I think that, that it's important to remember that in many ways uh, the focus on diversity was a compromise. Mm. Um, the last time the Supreme Court took up this decision, uh, they, in essence, uh, in order to not strike down uh, the use of race in, uh, uh, in admissions decisions, uh, they decided not to focus on issues of, of equity and justice mm -hmm. and on the fact that not everyone had an equal footing. And in fact, so what they did was that the reason why we could use it in places outside of this particular university, because we're an I-200 state, but in private schools mm -hmm. or in other, mm -hmm. was that they focused on diversity um, because that was good for all of us not mm -hmm. for the black and brown students. Right. And so I believe absolutely with all my heart in diversity, but feel it's kind of got us into a box. And mm -hmm. I'm just wondering, how do we work our way out of the fact that it's not just about this is good for all of us, although yeah. it is, but that there are some inequities? Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, I, I mean, my, my, my first answer to that is we have to dismantle I-200. Yeah, I'm, I'm with first you on that. And foam, foam. Um, that 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 it's clearly uh, a, a, an experiment that has not worked. That's only worked to resegregate our schools. Um, so that that would be my first my first answer. Um, and I agree with you 100% about about diversity. Uh, one of the things that I do with my students is that we, we look at on the web how diversity is written about. And it's almost always talked about for white students, right? Or as Ta-Nehisi Coates would say, as people who believe themselves to be white, right? So it's about the, the, the use value of sitting next to um, the multi-hued students, right? And then taking that out often into the business world. And it's never about these issues of, of disproportionality. And so I think that one of the first things that people need to understand as, you know, as I put up some of Hetty Lee's work there, is that when we're talking about inequality, we have to understand that it saturates every area of our lives and racialized inequality saturates every area of our lives. If we think about going for a home loan, if we think about going for, for any type of an education from preschool, from disproportionate punishment of preschool students all the way up through, through high school graduation rates, right? We know that black and brown kids are, are disproportionately the ones who are punished, who are, not, who are not the ones who are rising to the top. And this is not an accident. And so we need to have things um, like I-200 dismantled so that we can deal with the very real inequality that, that works its way through every aspect of our lives. There's a comment, um, really, at askrlj at uw.edu. There's a hint for you. This is just a note, as a musician and singer and white ally, I would observe that rests, periods of silence, are part of the music. Mm. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Please. Um, can y'all hear me? Yep. <laughs> All right. Uh, 
Um, well, I just first want to say thank you so much for doing this. It's uh, really meaningful and really important, um, especially as a woman of color. Really dig it. Um, and so, um, so the first question that was asked, you kind of talked about that, uh, the, the importance of a community um, mm -hmm. and being a part of a community. Um, and as a black student on campus, right, there's a thousand of us, so I feel like that community is really important, but I was wondering if you had any ideas on how to build that community, um, because it is so important, but since we're also spread out and there's yeah. so few of us, it is hard to create that community. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. Can you repeat the question? Mm -hmm. Oh, do you so, want to repeat it? You want me to well, repeat it? Well, Mariam, you're asking about how do you, as you one of a thousand black students and smaller number of black, uh-huh, <laughs> there's the choir, but um, how, how do we create and, and find community with each other? Yeah, thank you. Um, that was, I mean, that's, that's, that's all the, the, the part, my, my research study, that was all about this, this group of young, um, young women of color who created community here together. And the interesting thing about that group, so I had, um, just to give you a little bit of background, then I'll go to your question. So um, I, was, I was teaching in class. I had you know, a number of students that always like to come up and talk to me afterwards about issues of representation, and especially black women in representation. And so two of them, I started talking to more. We decided to do this group together. And they said, yeah, I'm gonna go, we're gonna go find friends, we're gonna bring people in. I never specified, so they knew we were gonna be looking at representations of black women, right? I didn't specify, you know, to find African American uh, undergrads. The first session they came and it was this, uh, you know, primarily African American group, but it was actually a multiracial group of other women of color. And so I think that the way the diversity looks in Seattle and in the Pacific Northwest is really different. Um, I think that there's a tremendous opportunity to create women of color coalition here. Um, and taking advantage of all of the wonderful resources on campus, um, I can plug our CCDE, uh, all of the different, different events that we have um, the, to bring students together. Um, our, I know that the, the ECC, uh, RSO, the Registered Student, Student Organizations, also foster tremendous community and the space of the ECC itself um, is, is just a wonderful home. Uh, but, but I think that, that showing up together constantly um, for things and, and working on making, making the community, and, and to me, and you know, I'm, I'm getting older, but I think that the face-to-face -face element is so key, that not just maintaining the Facebook group and tweeting each other, but actually physically seeing each other, being physically together when you're used to spaces not being welcoming to you. So to be able to face those spaces in community, I think is really, um, is really necessary to kind of, to, to give you the reserves, to build up your reserves, to get you through um, what can feel like a, a racist university. So here, here, I'm, I'm going to read this question yeah. to you at, as is and, okay. and, and hear the depth oh. of, the, of the question. I won't mention who wrote it. I'll, I'll, okay. um, I was born into the choir by my black father, but my white mother taught me just to sit and listen. Today, people tell me I have a beautiful voice, but I'm mm. afraid to sing. Mm. I do in private, but my fear of sounding terribly of ruining the song the choir sings literally paralyzes me. How do I see through my vocal dysmorphia? How can I address both the privilege and oppression that resonates in my voice? Oh my goodness. That, 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 that was that. beautiful. I mean, so, sometimes a question just requires just being silent. The question was powerful yeah. enough, but, yeah. but. Yeah. So your thoughts on the, on the question? Ooh. Mm -hmm. That was beautiful. Um, if you just want to end on I that think, note, that's no, okay. I, I do. I mean, I, I, I go back to, to community again. I go back to thinking about not singing in, in isolation, right? Of thinking about the small group that you might create mm -hmm. in order to sing together, to practice together. Um, and I think that that, that that is what gives people strength. So here's, here's, I'm just going to read the question oh, again. Okay. Can, can you, which is a preface to saying it's a powerful question, can you share about the role of love? I, I, first of all, I love this community that you ask questions about this. Can you share about the role of love, the verb, in building power amongst those of us who have been minoritized? I ask this in thinking about the remarks, responses, where you missed the mark on language. What is support 
solidarity, and what is not that? Sent from a tiny computing device. <laughs> wow. Mm -hmm. Wow. Um, I know this is going to sound one note, mm -hmm. but I think that investing in community is an act of love. Mm -hmm. um, I think about how when I, for example, had the first, first time experienced um, being dressed up kind of like this, maybe not quite this nicely, but still having a blazer on and standing up as a new assistant professor at the front of the room, ready to teach my first class, you know, having everything all ready to go, and having a line of students coming to my white male TA, who was, by the way, a bicycle commuter and dressed as such, <laughs> and having them come up to him and say, Professor, excuse me, Professor, can you tell me, Professor? Um, and my going into one of these very first classes was immediate defeat. But what I did instead, well, I was immediately defeated, but was to go to my community of friends and share exactly what had happened. And all they did was love me right back and validated me and said, I won't tell you what they said because it wouldn't be appropriate. <laughs> my children are in the front row. <laughs> but really kind of, I think, making yourself vulnerable um, to that community so that they have the privilege of, of loving you, right? Here's a question that is of this place and, and time. Can you speak on the tension between the need for a movement to be inclusive while still being able to close ranks and protect ourselves? There's a lot in that question. Yeah, yeah. Um, I think that one of the powerful things about Black Lives Matter as a consciousness raising movement is that it is calling for moments of separatism. Our students, for example, during the walkout this last February got together and made physical circles of black students where they were physically together. They called for the black undergraduates and that was, they were at the very center of the space. And I think that that is incredibly important. Yes. Questions from you. Hi, I've been a part of the racial equity dialogue so far this year, and I plan, plan on continuing. And a question that I have is um, whether this initiative that the university is um, sponsoring thus far is an all lives matter racial equity initiative or a black lives matter racial equity initiative. And I'm wondering if you have any insight on how we as UW students and participants in this initiative can tell the difference? Well, I think Dr. Taylor is head of that committee. <laughs> Not to put him on the spot. He's saw, saw always trying to step further over here. <laughs> I, you know, and, and so, and Anna just, so, uh, um, th this is, this, this was not set up as, a, as an either or paradigm, but I think Raylene addressed the all lives matter issue in, as, as a retort. Um, but, but I think, if, if I've got you correct, Anamari, th this was, a, again, on the heels of having watched black men die in the streets of, of Chicago and, La and Los Angeles. And, and when, when I mean watched, and this is a question for you, really, and, I mean for, and this is the difference between students of my generation and, and yours now, because what I heard students say is that they, they watched Eric Garner die, not just once, mm. not just twice, mm -hmm. but over and over and over again. And there's some trauma associated with, with, with that. And so, you know, I, I don't know if you want to take the question. You're standing up so clearly. You're, you're the president, so. I guess I started this one, so I'm, you know, putting back. You know, I, it was, I think it's complicated. Uh, there's no question that the issues are around power. They're about being minoritized. And that's more than black and white, so to speak. But. It was very conscious to call it race and equity because we wanted to call out race as in many ways in this country the iconic inequity because of our history of enslaving a particular color of people. 
So it is not all lives matter in this mamby-pamby way, um, but we do. There are many ways in which there are people that are marginalized, then there are people that are minoritized, and we don't want to take them out of the equation. But there's no question that it's race and equity and that race needs to be at the center. So if that... That's, that's exactly what I was going to say, but she said it. <laughs> she, she got most of it right, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead. Uh, hi, I am an undergrad in the uh, early childhood and family studies major. Um, and I definitely think that we as adults in this community heavily influence the um, ideas that children grow up with and how we show them how to be as adults in this country. Um, and so my question is, um, how, how in early childhood can we begin to address um, equity, equality, and diversity in meaningful ways um, to help you know, these kids? I feel like a lot of these questions and a lot of these talks that we have, we have as adults, and we have them mm -hmm. um, after we've already had a lot of experiences. And how do we start having those conversations mm -hmm. with children before they become damaged by these things? Thank you, thank you. Um, well, one, I think, is first about, about access. So to, to get those young children into high-quality, high-caliber preschools, because um, we know there's a, the, the, there's a huge amount of disproportionality of kids who are in, have access to those preschools and kids who simply do not. So making sure that everyone can have the opportunity where they can have those conversations. Um, and then one thing is, I think, fighting the desire for colorblindness that some folks, I won't name any names, that, that some folks tend to have, right? That somehow it is, um, it's a dirty word to, to identify another child, another adult on the basis of race or ethnicity. Uh, we, we see this all the time, right, with educators, I think, of, of young children, or I certainly saw it, you know, when, when my kids were, were in preschool, um, in an elementary school. And so kids from an early age learn that it's taboo to even name race. So why should they engage in any conversations of difference when they're told, no, that's Sally over there. Who's Sally? Oh, you know, with the green backpack on and she's got the barrettes, right? You know Sally. Um, but, you know, God forbid someone point out that Sally's Asian American. Right, and what is that? And what does that do then to our conception of what it means to be Asian American when it is a taboo word? Right. Coach said he started talking to his son about race at the moment his son could hold his head up. He started talking mm. right at the point he could listen. Mm -hmm. John mm -hmm. Fassen. Yeah. Hi, Dr. Joseph. Thank you for inviting me, and thank you for including the words of those young women, especially Vanessa, oh. who is very special to me, oh, as you know. Oh, Vanessa's dad. <laughs> <laughs> My participants all chose not to have pseudonyms. I actually tried to talk them into it a couple of times, and they all were, so I, said, I shared all of my work with them, and they said, no, we want our names, and so, yes. Yeah. Uh, my question has to do with the, your, your correct statement that all lives matter is, is reactive, mm. and it is, uh, it's a manifestation in my, opinion of, of guilt mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. an attempt to avoid some of these issues mm. because the flip side of unearned privilege, of white privilege, is guilt, mm. I think. Now, when we're trying to engage in these conversations, therefore, you know, you talked about Make Them Hear You. I love that. And mm. there's a song about that, by the way, <laughs> called Make Them Hear You. Mm. But it's hard to make somebody hear you when they're dealing with their own guilt. Mm -hmm. Now, um, we have two choices in that case. We can either try to help them with that, mm -hmm. but many uh, people of color don't feel that we have any obligation to help somebody else with their own guilt. Mm -hmm. But on the other hand, if we don't, then we can't, we won't have a dialogue. Mm -hmm. So do you have any strategies for dealing with that dilemma? Yeah. I think the strategy is that white people need to step up and talk to each other. <laughs> that white people... <laughs> 
white people don't need to have conversations about race that are always facilitated by people of color. And people of color don't need to be in the room. In fact, we shouldn't be in the room a lot of times. <laughs> Right? They should have those conversations together, and they should cry together, and they should feel guilty together, and they should come and figure out what that coalition looks like together, but leave us out of it sometimes. So I think that we can't, we can't solve that, that issue of guilt. I think that they need to, to, to figure out how to do that together. So we're running short of time, but, I want, but perhaps we can do this. Maybe what we can do, really, is we've got two questions here. And I've got two questions here. Maybe we can just hear the questions, and then you can close in response to whatever it is that you hear from these questions. So, so please. You had mentioned the University of Missouri, how the walkout of the football team uh, ultimately had implications on the, the president of the university. How do we engage in these, these uh, marches and these walkouts out and actually go from a progression standpoint? How do we actually progress? In, uh, resolve these inequalities. So University of Missouri football team refuses to play around issues of race in Missouri. And how do we, what was the last part of the question? Well, there, there are economic implications with that, and that's how the president mm -hmm. was uh, right. ultimately the resigned. Economic. But how do we go from these marches, these Black Lives Matter marches, and these walkouts to actually having progression with these racial inequalities that are happening mm. throughout right. the world? Right. Mm. Thank you. Do you want to, let's go to that question too, and let's hear them both. Hi, I emailed a portion of this question, but I'll just say it now. Um, so I want to go back to your metaphor about the choir, and I want to speak about some of us in the choir who sing on stage, and some who sing in the streets, um, in places we're not supposed to sing. And I wanted to ask if you could speak about um, different manifestations of activism, and also the difference between being on stage and it being your job to sing, and being, that being your work, and singing on the streets mm. of your own free will whenever you feel like it, and um, kind of with the Raise and Equity movement, or initiative, sorry, <laughs> um, it puts a lot of bodies of, of color on the front lines. Um, so I wonder if you could just talk about that. You want to respond? You want to hear a couple more questions? Really? Uh, th there is so much in both of those. Um, uh, so, so, so the the first young man was talking about um, how do how do we go from from protest to change? It seems like that's what what, what I'm I'm hearing there. And um, the young woman who just came up, who I I, I didn't track. Where are you? Okay, <laughs> um, thinking about how, how, how do we create the spaces to, to sing, to, um, to insert our anti-racist critiques, right, even if it's not, not our job to be up here doing that. Um, and th this is, a, the, the second one is easier than your question. Um, <laughs> they're both very difficult, uh, but, in terms of how to find those spaces, this is something that I talk with my students about all the time, that, that we're always um, confronted by inequality um, and we have to figure out the ways to step into the, the discomfort. Uh, and I think that that means that, for example, the moment that someone says something that's derogatory, and it doesn't necessarily have to be about your group, that you say something, and that, that you, you stop that conversation immediately, and you ask, like my young women did in the study, well, excuse me, can we just stop here for a second? Can you tell me what you meant by that? And that could be the beginning of a conversation, right? Or it can at least stop them and make them realize what they might have said. Uh, but, but finding all of those days, those spaces in your everyday life, I also think it's important to not feel like um, for, and I tell this to students of color, that, that you don't have to take on the weight of the world, right? Um, every time you are doing that type of an act, a type of anti-racist intervention, you're also investing yourself into it, right? You are giving away a part of yourself, and so you want to be in the space where you can think, this is going to make me stronger by making this type of intervention as opposed to this is gonna sap away my, my strength. Um, and then how, 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 does, how does protest become change? Um, I think protest becomes change when we start to change policies and structures and institutions. And it might happen slowly, 
um, indeed too slowly for many of us. Um, but the fact that we have our president sitting here who can change policy at the university, that is a step to me towards change. Um, I think that as, as much as we're, we're, we're out here protesting, if we have um, Samuel Alito at the Supreme Court saying what he does, we will continue to have these tremendous fights. Um, but I think that one of the things I try and point out to my students is the importance of seeing and appreciating incremental change. And to me, the consciousness raising that's happening on college campuses right now is not just small incremental change, that's huge. The fact that people are seeing this disproportionality that um, just a couple years back, people had no idea, the mainstream couldn't fathom talking about, that we're having these conversations, to me that means change. And we'll continue to work on changing the institutions. We'll continue to work on trying to create that substantive, long-lasting change. Um, but I think it does come from the consciousness raising and the protest. So here's your final uh, summation. And I, I want to put it in the form of, okay. of two questions um, that I'm assuming come from two students. Picture Tiffany and, and Dylan. Tiffany asks, my question is about the use and context of person of color, in quotes. I'm identified as Asian American, so thereby a person of color. I struggle with communicating with myself and others who range from the spectrum of, quote, preaching to the choir to preaching against the choir. With using this term, in my mind, memories of people saying it is an exclusive term, that it comes from an oppressive history, so why continue using it? What are your thoughts about the use of the term person of color? Dylan, shortly thereafter, not related, but you earlier invoked Tanahashi Coates' phrase, people, who believe themselves to be white. He later speculates that for the sake of justice, perhaps they will need to be something besides white else again. As a white man, I'm contemplating on how my racial identity has been constructed and needs to be deconstructed. Mm -hmm. But I'm wondering where to begin. I wonder if you can comment on the label white and what might replace it. You have a student talking about the construct of person of color. You have a student asking about the social construct of, of whiteness. As you talk to your students and as you teach, Relina, how do you talk to them about their own sense of identity and the language that they use and the deconstruction of that language? And perhaps you can close on that note and we can. Okay. These are like million dollar questions here to, clo to close on. Um, uh, yeah, the, 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 yes, language. So, so this, this, this is one of the, the paradoxes that we talk about of race, right? That we understand that, that race is a social construction we understand that it's a total fallacy, it was made up, and yet it has very real implications in our lives. And so we use terminology that is racialized. Um, and I think it's important to use racialized terminology to not fall into the trap of colorblindness as the woman who was asking about early childhood education was talking about. Um, uh, you know, people talk about, about race is a construct, it is, is, is uh, oh no, I just lost it, I had the best turn of phrase. Um, but race is a construction, but it has very real import and impact in our, in our lives. Um, at the same time, I think that the, the deconstructing of the whiteness goes to Dr. Vassell's question about guilt, right? <clears throat> Trying to get to the place where you are not claiming whiteness doesn't, to me mean that you're not in the place where you understand the histories and legacies, that you understand all of the benefits, the fact that whiteness is property, as, as, as critical race scholar uh, Cheryl Harris would tell us, right? Um, so trying to figure out how, how do we deal with the, the fact that we understand that this thing is completely constructed and we need to move beyond it, and yet it has weight, and to me, People of color is, is a beautiful term, right? It's a way in which we think about communities and coalition coming together. Um, and minoritized people being able to see commonality and to fight for that substantive change, to fight for that institutional change. Um, but there, there is a place for everyone in this conversation. There's a place for everyone to come together um, and it might be, as I'm suggesting, coming together separately first, right? And coming together at another point and learning how to be silent, right? But we need everyone to be in the room. We need everyone to be fighting together. 
um, if we are going to really create the type of change that we need to dismantle the inequalities that still continue to plague our world. You are a scholar, you are a leader, you are a choir conductor. Thank you for leading us in our song today. Thank you. Thank you.